video exercise, we'll use the simulation interaction diagram to analyze and survey the protein-ligand interactions for a Desmond molecular dynamics trajectory we ran in a previous exercise on the streptavidin biotin complex. So let's begin by opening the simulation interaction diagram panel by going to Applications, Desmond, Simulation Interactions Diagram. Or if you're in the task view mode, go to Tasks, Molecular Dynamics, Simulation Interactions Diagram. Or browse for it in the task tree. Once the panel is open, we'll need to click Load to load in the data. Now the first time you run this, you'll need to load in the trajectory file, i.e. the dash out.cms file, which should be in the same location as the trajectory directory, which contains the trajectory frames needed to be analyzed. Notice that you can also load in the .eaf event analysis file, which is the output for the simulation interactions diagram, meaning that you can quickly load in a previous analysis. Now here, it prompts us to choose the protein and ligand. We can either define the protein or ligand with the atom selection panel, or leave it on auto, which should automatically identify the protein and ligand. Here, we can choose the reference structure from either a frame or from a file. Here, we'll just leave it on frame zero, i.e. the starting frame as the reference. We'll then choose the analysis types, which include the RMSD, RMSF for both protein and ligand, protein ligand interactions, and ligand torsions. In this example, we'll select all of them, However, keep in mind that we ran this simulation for 50 nanoseconds and it may take a little while, about one hour, to run all the analysis types. Next, we'll click Run. Notice in this case that it identified two ligands. This is of course the streptavidin biotin dimer, which contains two biotins. So we'll just select one of them and then click OK. And then we can click Start. OK, once that has loaded, we can see the various tabs with the analysis types we selected. Here we have the PLRMSD, or protein and ligand root mean square deviation. This is used to measure the scalar distance for the protein and ligand throughout the trajectory. For the protein RMSD, let's see how the C-alpha and sidechain RMSDs evolved over the 50 nanosecond period. So in other words, all protein frames are first aligned on the reference frame backbone, and then the RMSD is calculated based on the C-alpha or sidechain. Now, monitoring the RMSD of the protein can provide insights into the structural conformations throughout the simulation. It can indicate if the simulation has equilibrated and its fluctuations throughout the simulation are around some thermal average. Changes on the order of 1 to 3 angstroms are perfectly acceptable for small globular proteins like the streptavidin biotin complex in this example. But be aware of changes much larger than 3 angstroms, which may indicate the protein is undergoing a large conformational change during the simulation. Now it is important that the simulation converges or that the RMSD values stabilize at around a fixed value, much like it is here where it starts to plateau. If the RMSD of the protein is still changing towards the end of the simulation, then the simulation may be too short, so a longer simulation is required. Now let's also show the ligand RMSD. We'll choose aligned on ligand as that corresponds to superpositioning or fitting as well as measuring the RMSD using the ligand heavy atoms as opposed to measuring the ligand RMSD but using the protein heavy atoms for superpositioning slash fitting. Now the ligand RMSD gives some insight into how stable the ligand is with respect to the protein binding pocket. Now the fact that we chose align on ligand means that we effectively are seeing the internal fluctuations within the ligand structure. Here we have the PRMSF or protein root mean square fluctuations. This plot is useful for characterizing the local fluctuations of the protein. Again, here you can choose what to show. We'll just leave it on the C alphas. Now the peaks indicate the areas of the protein that fluctuate the most during the simulation, where on the X axis we can see the residue locations within the protein. Typically the N and C termini tails tend to fluctuate the most, but you can see here an example of a residue that fluctuates by around 3.3 angstroms. Secondary structure elements like alpha helices and beta strands are usually more rigid than unstructured parts of the protein and thus will fluctuate less. Now here we can overlay the secondary structure elements by checking on secondary structure. Here the blue stripes correspond to beta strands which indeed coincide with less fluctuations. Red regions would correspond to helices, but this protein doesn't have any. We can also check on ligand contacts, which uses the green bars to indicate the protein residues that are interacting with the ligand. We can also correlate the protein RMSF with the experimental B factors of the protein. 
Now, due to the difference of RMSF and B-factor definitions, you should not expect one-to-one -one correspondence. However, the simulation results should parallel the crystallographic data. Here we have the LRMSF or ligon root mean square fluctuations, where we show the ligon fluctuations broken down by each atom shown on the x-axis and corresponding to the 2D structure. Ligon RMSF may provide insight on how ligon fragments interact with the protein and their entropic role in the binding event. So here we have the RMSF values for the ligon heavy atoms where the system is aligned on the protein or aligned on the ligon. We can see that atoms 2 and 3 corresponding to the oxygens on the carboxylate show large fluctuations. This makes sense in that this tail region of the ligand is somewhat solvent exposed and able to rotate easily around the 1 to 4 atom bond so it can interact with the various waters. Whereas atoms 4 to 16 are buried deeper in the binding pocket and have less space to move around and thus have lower fluctuations. Protein interactions with the ligand can be monitored throughout the simulation in the PL contacts or protein ligand contacts tab. In the above plot, we see a summary of these interactions, but we can choose to include one type of contact at a time to reveal even more information about that contact. So let's look at these in detail, starting with hydrogen bonds. But first, let's note that we can keep our cursor over any of these checkboxes to see a tooltip with the definitions. Okay, here we have four categories of hydrogen bonds, including the backbone donor or acceptor and sidechain donor or acceptor hydrogen bonds. For serine 27, we can see that it is interacting with the ligand over the course of the 50 nanoseconds by making 0.942 contacts. Now these contacts are normalized, so you can also say that it's interacting with the ligand about 94.2% of the time. For tyrosine 43, we can say that it's interacting with the ligand 100% of the time. Now for asparagine 49, we can see that it's making a hydrogen bond with the ligand more than one or more than 100% of the time. Now it's able to be more than 100% because asparagine 49 is making two types of hydrogen bonds during this period. It's acting as a backbone donor about 84.7% of the time, while also acting as a side chain donor about 23.9% of the time. Here we can see the hydrophobic interactions. So for example, tryptophan 108 exhibits hydrophobic interactions about 30.7% of the time, but no pi pi stacking or pi cation interactions were detected in this system. Only one ionic interaction was established by arginine 84, but this was extremely brief at only 0.1% of the time. Now here we can see the interactions to the ligand that were bridged by a water molecule and broken down as either donor or acceptor. Here we can see that tyrosine 54 and tryptophan 79 were able to interact with the ligand about 13-14% to of the time, even though the residues themselves did not form any direct hydrogen bonding interactions with the ligand. Okay, now if we include all contacts again, we just see the summary of the results without the individual breakdown. Now below this plot we have a timeline of the contacts where you can see the total number of contacts being made to the ligand by the protein over the 50 nanosecond period. While below that we can see when the contacts were being made, referring to the time on the x-axis, which residues were making them, based on the y-axis, and how many contacts were being made, based on the color intensity. So for example here, arginine 84 seemed to make most of its contacts with the ligand between the 17.5 to 30 nanosecond period, and those contacts were mostly direct hydrogen bonds to the ligand, with some mediated by water. Now asparagine 128 has a similar number of contact counts as arginine 84, but notice in the timeline that it has a lighter orange color, indicating that arginine 84, with its darker orange color, was able to make multiple contacts at a given time. Now the last thing to note on this panel is that you can select the trajectory range. So for example, perhaps you're only interested in the last 20 nanoseconds of the simulation, or during the period where the protein RMSD values stabilize. In the LP contacts or ligand protein contacts tab, we see a detailed schematic of the ligand atom interactions with the protein residues. Below, we have the legend describing the various interactions and residue types. And up top, we have the minimum contact strength slider. So if we move the slider to the right, we increase the contact strength and show that in this example, tyrosine 43 and serine 27 donate side chain hydrogen bonds more than 90% of the time to this oxygen. As we lower the contact strength, we start to notice more interactions. 
So here we now see the residues that make contacts with the ligand at least 50% of the time. And moving it even lower, we can see where cases where waters momentarily start to bridge interactions. Just like in the protein ligand context tab, you may want to restrict the analysis to a specific trajectory range. Here we have the L torsions or ligand torsions plot, which summarizes the conformational evolution of every rotatable bond or torsion in the ligand throughout the simulation trajectory. Here is the 2D schematic of the ligand with color-coded rotatable bonds. Now each rotatable bond or torsion is accompanied by a dial or radial plot as well as a bar plot of the same color. Clicking the legend button will provide some useful information on how to interpret these plots. So the dial plot describes the conformation of the rotatable bond throughout the course of the simulation where the start of the simulation is at the center and as time progresses the torsion evolution radiates outwards. So here the blue rotatable bond seems to be spinning around quite a bit while these other bonds tend to have a more defined spread of the torsion angles. The bar plot summarizes the data on the dial plots by binning the probability density of the torsions from the simulation. If the torsion potential information is available, the plot will contain the potential of the rotatable bond. The values of the potential are on the left y-axis of the chart and are expressed in kilocalorie per mole. So looking here for example, we see that when the potential energy for this rotatable bond is lowest, here and here, we see that most of those torsion angles are also being found out here and here. But in this plot, we can see that there are quite a few cases of torsion angles with a higher potential energy. So looking at the histogram and torsion potential relationships may provide insight into the conformational strain the ligand undergoes in maintaining the protein bound conformation. Here we can generate a report of the analysis conducted by the simulation interaction diagram. We can export into the current directory a PDF report, the individual plots or the raw data themselves. Here we can see the PDF report. Notice that the report is described in detail to aid with the interpretation of any of the various plots and charts. The raw data folder contains the individual files and data which you may opt to load into another program like Excel. While the images folder contains the images of the various plots, charts and diagrams.